Hello, I'm Mary Ito, and welcome to the Cram Podcast. Now, could it be someone you know, or maybe it's even you? Narcissism has been a hot topic lately. It's created all kinds of interest on social media, articles online, TV shows, and so on. And if you bring up the topic with anyone, I think there's a good chance they'll say, oh yeah, that's my boss, or a colleague, or a family member, or yep, that's my spouse. We recently did a podcast with researcher Delroy Paulus on the dark triad. This term refers to the three most dangerous personality traits of psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and narcissism, and that got a lot of interest. But of course, with all the attention paid to narcissism, there's also a lot of misinformation. And it's one thing to identify it as a problem, but then what? How do we manage this trait that can cause serious problems in our life and the lives of others? We've invited Dr. Martin Drapeau back for some answers. He's a clinical psychologist and professor of counseling psychology and psychiatry at McGill University. Hello, Martin. It is great to have you back again. Hi, Mary. Thanks for having me again. Well, let's start off um, and just talk about, it it seems like there is a lot of interest in narcissism uh, lately. Why do you think that is? Well, that's a great question. I think it, it may seem like there's a lot of interest in narcissism and that that might certainly be the case, but I think it's perhaps a more general trend or waves of trends that focus on on various conditions. So now there's a buzz around narcissism, uh, often often unfortunately in the context of labeling, labeling other people because God forbid we would recognize narcissism in ourselves, right? So there's a buzz around narcissism, but there was a trend um, at one point, uh, perhaps a decade ago, around ADD, ADHD. Everyone thought they had ADD. Everyone thought their partner had ADHD and so on and so forth. So you can go back like that to the, perhaps the 80s and 90s where everyone was talking about borderline personality disorder, for example. So um, these are trends. I think they're, of, of course, facilitated by social media. Uh, there's also another trend which, which is related to trauma. So there's a trend toward uh, what some have called, uh, mostly psych- psychologists and sociologists, they've called it victimhood culture. So we see this in university campuses. Uh, we see it more broadly in society. And what this idea implies is that we see the world in two categories, those who are bad, uh, more specifically those who abuse and those who are good. And in this case, those who are to be more specific, those who are abused. Uh, we see this in clinical practice where patients come in, they say they're traumatized because of something that someone did or something uh, that by most standards at least uh, could be described as a, you know, otherwise small offense or something that perhaps was hurtful, uh, like anything we might experience on a, on a daily basis. But they, they, the experience they, they feel is, is blown out of proportion. So you hear people in clinical practice saying things like, my boss said no to me going on vacation and this and that on this and that day. So, you know, this is, of course, something that can happen. Uh, it's part of normal life. And they say that it was so hurtful that they were traumatized. Now, now if you're going to see the world in, in, in such a dichotomous world, of course, you have those who are traumatized, but then you need a, a perpetrator, right? And then we fall into those who are hypersensitive and those who are accused of being responsible for our own distress. And this is where this idea, uh, unfortunately, of uh, narcissism is being pr- brought into play without minimizing the implications. But I hear more and more patients say, you know, my husband's a narcissist. My boss is a narcissist. Well, maybe they are. Maybe they are. They are. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's just, you know, everyday adversity. Um, well, you know what? It, it's interesting because you did mention social media and we are seeing a lot of this play out on social media where we're seeing um, accusations. Uh, of narcissism uh, against other people. We are also seeing this wave of people who they self-declare themselves as narcissists. So, you know, I think it's important that because, I mean, it is actually a, a, a condition. It is a mental health disorder. And I think maybe we should be clear about what exactly It is. So can you talk about what is narcissism? I mean, what are the characteristics? Well, I think there's a few things to say about this. So first of all, narcissism, it's not bad, right? So there's there's many models out there. There's a lot of theories. Uh, They all tend to converge around certain aspects of the condition or this trait. You can call it a trait as well. very often clinicians will talk, uh, will split it in two. They'll say there's, there's primary narcissism, which, which relates to the sense of, you know, 
uh, physical and psychological integrity or being a distinct person, uh, being a person who's different from others, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see this is very basic, uh, mm -hmm. normally develops early on in life. Uh, it's a good thing. You want this. Um, you know, it's not, uh, if you were to compare with the, another extreme, it would be psychosis, right? Where people lose that sense of primary narcissism of integrity. Then there's a secondary narcissism, and many would associate that. Um, it's not quite right, but let's go with that for now. Um, maybe it's not unrelated to self-esteem, for example. So narcissism, in some ways, is the sense of having value, uh, self-esteem, uh, perhaps having a purpose in life, you know, feeling generally good about yourself. And, and this is also, of course, something that we want. Now, the problem, and I, th I think this is what you want to get at, is that you can have too much of it, you know, uh, too much narcissism. Um, and this is where we're really moving into something slightly different uh, that's related to psychopathology, mental disorders, mental illness. And in this case, when we talk about narcissism, the, the uh, psychopathological form is narcissistic personality disorder. So that's, that's very yes. different. That's very different. Um, that uh, uh, typically presents with, you know, tremendous uh, lack of flexibility. So uh, people who have narcissistic personality disorder or NPD, well, they're not flexible. They, they behave the same way in all situations. So if you see your partner, your husband, you know, uh, being a little pompous and, and, and uh, grandiose when he's talking to his parents, but he's not doing that with other people, odds are he's not a great narcissist. He's just a normal person who's dealing with family matters, right? So lack of flexibility uh, has to be maladaptive, right? So it cuts across different conditions. It leads to different problems. It could be at work, uh, could be with the, within the family, with the partner, and so on and so forth. And it has to be persisting. So it has to uh, occur over a long period of time. You cannot turn on narcissistic personality and then turn it off. It's there, right? Mm. Um, there's specific criteria. I mean, what comes to mind, of course, when we think narcissism and more specifically narcissistic uh, personality disorders, grandiose, uh, need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. Although that's not always present, but it's often present, the uh, lack of empathy. And a lot of clinicians believe there's actually two types, one that's more grandiose and one that's a little more uh, vulnerable. Right. So the one who's grandiose would be the one who, you know, has these feelings of grandiosity, of course. Uh, they tend to be a little more aggressive interpersonally and they display, they tend to display a lot more boldness. Whereas the one who's vulnerable, well, it's hypersensitive and tremendous defensiveness. So these are two types. Now, some people fall in either one of the two categories. In most cases, what happens is that you have both at the same time. They're just different points in time. Right. So I might have a grandiose uh, demonstration or display of narcissistic personality disorder. I'm faced with tremendous adversity. The armor cracks. What happens? I become the vulnerable type. So, you know, self-willing, hypersensitive, uh, being hypersensitive and feeling tremendously defensive. So you, you can have both mm, yeah, yeah. different states. Okay. Um, um, can I ask you, how common is NPD in the population? Not all that common. I mean, it, in North America, the estimates vary between 0.5% uh, to about 1%. Some bring it up to 2% based on the studies. Of course, it varies on the setting. So if the, the numbers I just gave are for the general population, right? But in hospital settings, you're going to have a higher uh, prevalence or more cases of NPD, narcissistic personality disorder. But it's a low rate condition, right? You know, yeah, 1%, okay. 2%. So it's not all that frequent. So if you think that all your colleagues, your boss, your husband, <laughs> you're probably on the wrong track. You're probably on the wrong track. Think twice. Okay. Um, the other thing I was curious is, do we know whether there is a strong genetic component to this? That's a great, great question. Um, there's some research that suggests that there may be some genetic predisposition. It's not quite clear. Um, for example, there are some early character traits that you'll see in infants that tend to be related to the diagnosis of NPD later on. Things like, you know, being a little more aggressive, reduced tolerance to distress. Um, these are character traits, reduced tolerance to frustration, difficulty, you know, managing, managing your emotions. So you can see this in children, infants, adolescents, and so on and so forth. There seems to be some evidence along those lines. Um, there's a lot of research also that should suggest that any kind of significant negative life experiences in childhood, uh, being rejected, bullying, having a fragile ego, a fragile sense of self, 
Some research suggests that might be related to narcissistic personality disorder. And we do see in, in clinical practice, we see patients who uh, present with or, or develop what could be considered a narcissistic tendency as a way to defend against feelings of, of simply being completely inadequate. You know, so in, in pop psychology, you would say they compensate or they're overcompensating. You know, so I, I don't feel very good about myself. I'm not very proud of, my, of myself. I don't feel all that likable or interesting or competent. And so I inflate my qualities, right? So that would be compensation. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a little bit of that happening in some cases. And, and we've all done this, of course, <laughs> at least once in our well, life. Yeah. So, so the thing is, I mean, you say that, um, NPD is, is not that common, maybe one, maybe at the most 2% of the population. But, um, I'm a, I'm assuming that there are people who, you know, they're, they're not necessarily diagnosed with NPD, right? They don't fit all the criteria, but they do have maybe a certain level of narcissism that is problematic. You know, they might feel it's problematic or other people feel it's problematic in their relationship. That's, that depends. I mean, you know, um, a healthy relationship is a relationship where everyone, uh, get, gains something and nobody's hurt. So you can have, you could have a relationship with someone who's a narcissist, um, not necessarily a narcissist who's malignant. So that would have antisocial, uh, personality mm-hmm. or traits, for example. And that could, that could work out fine. You know, you might have individuals who tend to be a little more submissive. So living with someone who's narcissistic or somewhat narcissistic might be exciting and it might be reassuring. You can also have situations where you have two narcissists. In, the, in, in a relationship and they feed off of each other, right? So you can have situations like that. Narcissism is not necessarily bad. You need narcissism because life throws things at you sometimes and you have to be able to deal with them. And it takes right. some healthy level of narcissism to do that. It really becomes problematic when we're turned and you have to think of it in terms of a continuum, right? So when yeah. it becomes, when you pass that threshold and it becomes a personality disorder, that's when it becomes more problematic which doesn't mean you can't have a relationship with somebody like that. But when you pass the next threshold, which is a level of, for example, greater level of aggression, an absolute lack of empathy, then you're getting closer to something that might be uh, similar to antisocial personality traits. Those are major red flags. And that's, that makes things a lot more complicated. Okay. So yeah, let's, let's talk then about when it does enter, it starts to enter that danger zone where it's problematic in a relationship. Like, how do you know? I mean, what, what are the signs when something's not right here? Um, well, the, the first thing is that when you start a relationship with someone who's narcissistic, um, even with somebody who's more narcissistic than, than what we would hope for, who would have narcissistic personality disorder, is that, is that you know, it could be very charming, right? So uh, if you're a narcissist, you need people around you and you need them to, to like you, uh, admire you, worship you. And, and, and one of the ways of doing that is sometimes doing good things. Now you're doing it for a purpose, right? Which is to gain that admiration that you're, you're, you absolutely are dying to get. Um, so at first it's really hard. It's very charming. Everything is beautiful. It gets complicated when, when you, um, start feeling like there's a lack of empathy, when you're not being heard, when you feel like you're being used for the, by the other person for him or her to meet their own, uh, needs. I say him or her because there are some women who have narcissistic personality disorder as well. Typically it's like three and four are men. Uh, so there's some women, uh, 25% about. So when you're in a relationship where uh, you're being taken advantage of. There's a lack of empathy. Uh, you're not being understood. There's a lack of interest. And again, when you pass that threshold, um, absolute selfishness, levels of aggression, those are major red flags. So then, then that's when you pick up your things and, and you, you make a run for it. Oh, is that right? There's no, there's no other way around that. No, but don't forget that as, as you're, as you, uh, see these new variables or traits, we're getting, we're moving beyond what would be a, a simple narcissistic personality and into yeah, something right. that could be called a, a malignant narcissistic personality, which is a more severe form. In those cases, the empathy is even lower. There's a, a lack of ability to feel empathy, to express empathy. So that's a little different. Also, violence can be used in greater proportion because relationships are instrumental. Right. So if I'm in a relationship with you, I'm in a relationship because I need something from you. Right. So, of course, the more severe the case, the more that's going to be present when those things are really present. And you have you add the violence, for example. So people who have antisocial personality disorder, which is a 
severe form of personality disorder will often have narcissistic personality disorder as well, whereas the other way around is not necessarily true. So what you really want to work, uh, pay attention to is traits that might start resembling antisocial personality disorder or, you know, the, you know, the, the, the lack of empathy, the lack of emotion, uh, being unable to sympathize or lacking interest in what you're experiencing and feeling like you're being used for another purpose. Those are, those are the red flags. Mm. So if that's the case, the person then who is the narcissist, right? And we're, so we're talking about um, a severe case where you said it's, it's now getting into an antisocial disorder problem. Mm -hmm. um, how am amenable is that to treatment? So the person who, the partner or the person who has the No, condition? the person who has it. Okay. Um, who has the disorder. Yeah. Well, typically what happens is that um, people who have narcissistic personality do not seek services for the narcissistic personality disorder. That, that's, that's quite unusual. What will, ha what will happen more typically is they'll have um, a major problem at work. Uh, they'll be faced with adversity and then the armor cracks and then they develop depression or anxiety and then they'll come and seek services for the depression and anxiety. So people who have depression and anxiety, leaving aside the NPD for now, they, they usually come to therapy, they say, doc, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I need help, right? So someone who's a narcissist, narcissistic personality disorder, does not come to therapy for the NPD. They come because they're suffering mm. and that would typically look like depression or anxiety. Um, so that, that's, it's, it's very different, right? So one of the questions you have to ask yourself, of course, as a clinician is, especially in private practice is how much time do I have with this person and what am I going to focus on? Right? So if the person is coming for depression and anxiety, you might want to focus on the depression and anxiety and not necessarily focus on the personality disorder. So that depends. If you're working in a hospital setting where you might have uh, multiple uh, professionals involved and there's no time limit. Ideally, it's not always the case, but ideally, then you can afford to tap in to um, get some work started uh, to address the narcissistic personality disorder. And, that, and that's a long process. It takes a lot of time. It's not like treating depression. Um, and uh, it's a therapy. And how that, successful is therapy? Like for, well, <laughs> for treating the NPD? Well, it, it mixed results. Again, that varies. The more malignant, malignant the less uh, the prognosis is good. If you have antisocial traits, the prognosis is very bleak. It's very, it's, it's actually quite negative. These are hard conditions to treat. Again, you have to ask yourself, what am I treating, right? So mm -hmm. you might have someone who's narcissistic, um, you know, milder form of, of the personality disorder, or someone who has a more severe form of the personality disorder. What are you trying to treat? Are you treating the depression? So that would be a good outcome if I managed to make them less depressed. If I'm trying to treat the narcissistic personality, that's a long-term course over. We're not talking about days or weeks. We're talking months, many months and years. here. And then what about the person who is the other half of that relationship? The person who is not the narcissist? You know, what do you see in practice with, with therapy with, with those patients? You know, what, what do they... What are they upset about? What, what, you know, what are they trying, what are they grappling with? Well, I mean, you can imagine if, you know, based on what we've described as, as someone who's, uh, who's a narcissist, you know, not being heard, that's, that's hurtful, uh, repeatedly not being heard, um, seeking comfort in your partner who cannot express any kind of empathy, uh, that's hurtful, um, uh, having this feeling that you, your existence, your existence is built around supporting the other person's narcissism, right? So you have to, your role is basically, you know, the person who supports the other um, as opposed to having your own space in the relationship. These are all things that people find extremely difficult uh, um, in, in relationship with, with anyone and more so with someone who's, who's um, uh, narcissistic. So therapy is going to be a lot about, um, um, finding a balance. Like I said, some people could feel somewhat well or well with someone who can be narcissistic, uh, but there has to be a balance. Uh, everyone should get something out of the relationship. Show, no one should be harmed. Uh, and if the relationship is devastating, uh, and that can certainly be the case sometimes, then the work of the therapist will aim at supporting the partner, uh, building resilience, uh, building courage, uh, perhaps uh, building a, a stronger sense of identity and value if the person has been repeatedly hurt by their partner who has NPD. And of course, protecting them from harm as well. So good therapists 
doesn't just work in the here and now. You have to look down the road and think about potential situations that might be problematic for the patient. So if the patient's partner is a true narcissist, um, and, and even more so if they have antisocial traits or is prone to violence and aggression, well, think twice before you tell your patient that they should self-assert or confront, right? So you have to think about mm-hmm, these things mm-hmm. and find ways to, to work around them. Do you find something um, common among people who have very close relationships with narcissists? Like, would there be um, an attack on their own self-confidence and self-esteem, sort of the opposite of what narcissism is. Yeah, well, it's a compensation. Again, this this varies greatly from one couple to the next, right? But uh, it's not unusual for people to, once they pass the honeymoon phase of, you know, my partner, the one with the narcissistic personality, so we're so loving, caring, and and, and so on, and and he's so great. And, and, and of course, when we fall in love, we tend to idealize, right? So it's sort of conducive to, 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 to this kind of behavior and relationship. Um, but once, you know, days go by, weeks go by, months go by, sometimes uh, years, by in most cases, people realize before it takes years, but then you start realizing, realizing that the relationship is really about the other person, not about you as, as the partner, right? So it's about them, their success, um, them being pompous, them being grandiose. And you have a role in which you would have to um, erase yourself because your own success might be perceived as a threat to your partner who has narcissistic personality disorder. Not always, sometimes. So you do have to um, uh, erase yourself and then your role quickly becomes one of being a sidekick. You know, a bit a bit like, like Robin in Batman, right? So you're the sidekick mm-hmm. and you're there to support the other person's uh, success. And you talk about your husband who's very really successful and, you, and at first you have tremendous pride in that, but it becomes a little more complicated or problematic, I, sh- I should say, when you have to erase yourself in from the relationship and that your only role in that relationship is to support the other person's narcissism. You know how you said, though, that, you know, sometimes depending on the degree of narcissism, it can, it can still work, right? The relationship can still work. All so, sorts of relationships. Yeah, work. right. <laughs> Tell us, exactly, right. Sometimes. So, okay. So let's just say you have a relationship where one partner tends to be more narcissistic and, and it is a problem. Let's just say, and, and it's the husband. Okay, so um, and the what, problematic narcissism here, right? Yeah, problematic, okay. yeah. And the wife um, loves her husband uh, doesn't mind being a sidekick, mm-hmm. right? That's okay. But not all the time, mm-hmm. not all the time. And she does still need to be heard sometimes. Mm-hmm. So she really does want to try and make it work. And mm-hmm. he does too. Mm-hmm. Like how does counseling then help, right? Like, how does she deal with those times that are very difficult because maybe it can come to a head, right? Where she, you know, she's just had it, but she doesn't want to totally give up on the relationship. How do they work through those times? Well, in that specific example, um, not knowing, you know, the rest of, yeah. you know, m- much more than what you've told me, I think couples therapy might be the way to go. Because if it's a matter of, of communicating and getting someone, because you can, you can, this is going to sound funny, but you can teach someone how to pay attention to others as well, right? Um, so in couples therapy, they would, they would work on those specific, specific situations where the person feels like, oh, I, I want to be heard too. Sometimes I want to be valued. I want to be loved, appreciated, and so on and so forth, which is normal in a normal relationship. So that would be a couples therapy situation. It wouldn't be a therapy necessarily in the case that you get, you described where we would focus on individual therapy for the narcissistic personality disorder. A good right. therapist will focus on, on the dynamics within the couple because that gets very, very complicated. And in doing so, might address narcissism and could go as far as say, well, you know, that's not very nice of you. You know, it sounds like everything seems to revolve around you all the time. You know, how can we find a way um, uh, to give more space to your wife, your partner? Mm-hmm. Um, does it seem surprising to you? Because you want to create doubt too, right? Because someone who's a narcissist, there isn't much doubt, right? So you want to create doubt. Is it understandable to you that your wife might sometimes feel like she's not being heard? Oh, let's start thinking about that a little bit. And let's start thinking a little bit about those situations where this happens and how we can change this gradually. So that would be a focus a lot more on the relationship than on trying to treat narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. Now, you said earlier that narcissism tends to affect more men than women. 
about mm-hmm. 25% of women might have ND, NPD, right? Yeah. What, what, why is that? Why are more men affected by this? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Is there a socialization aspect? Um, there, there may be. Uh, is there a genetic aspect? There may be. Um, uh, there, uh, there's a, certainly differences in the way women tend to internalize, what men tend to externalize. So that there may be a little bit of that. There's also overlap between uh, antisocial personality disorder and other conditions. So, for example, borderline uh, personality disorder, uh, narcissistic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder, they're part of the same category of diagnoses, right? So, so there are a certain cluster of, of conditions that, that share similar traits, which is why they sometimes tend to co-occur, which is you know, what we call comorbid conditions. Men will have more of the uh, narcissistic and Women in general will express that uh, similar dynamics through borderline personality disorder, for example. Men will express it more through antisocial personality disorder. So it's not quite clear why, but there's something in these diagnoses that capture, to some extent at least, potentially gender differences. Oh, so does NPD show up differently in women than men? No, not necessarily. The, oh. the different, the difference will be in terms of level of not always. Again, you know, we have to take, you know, things into consideration. This is very nuanced, but in general, men will have a greater tendency towards, uh, the lack of empathy, but more importantly, towards aggression. So higher levels of aggression in extreme forms of narcissism, right? So we're not talking about, you know, your healthy, normal narcissism. Yeah. We're talking about more severe cases of, of a narcissistic PD. So a little, little more aggression than women. I'm curious to know what you're seeing in your practice as well, because, you know, we started off and I was saying, oh, you know, there seems to be a lot of talk about narcissism online, you know, social media articles, et cetera. And you said, well, we go through various trends, but what do you, so I don't know, maybe is that trend reflected though, in what you see in your clinic? Oh, definitely. I mean, this is reflected in, I I train at uh, university, I train future psychologists. It's it's reflected in, in university students various cohorts. It's reflected um, in my private practice. I'm at the, my clinic right now. Uh, people talk about these things. We'll see the, the, the two big themes that seem to be going hand in hand these days that we hear about repeatedly, both in private practice, also in training centers, is trauma and narcissism. Uh, I, you know, I, I talked a little bit about why I think they somehow co-occur in people's discourse. You know, one is the good person, the victim, and then there's the 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 opposite side, which is you know the, the perpetrator. So, so the worldview is very dichotomous, right? So these things do come in uh, to play, uh, both in university training and in, uh, in, in in private practice. There's no doubt. Mm. And when you say you may not need to work on an exit strategy if there's really no other way around it. How does that work? Like, how what what is involved in an exit strategy? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, the the answer is is really um, it's the same as in any type of relationship, right? So, a um, few general rules uh, about break uh, breakups, I guess. And, 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 and while we're at it, so first, I mean, the first thing, of course, is to anticipate. So that means thinking about what your post breakup plan might be. So, what's going to happen once you break up? Uh, where are you going to go? Uh, who's going to support you? Are there financial implications and so on and so forth? So you have to plan about these things. And of course, in, like in any relationship, and that goes for breaking up, but also for getting married, you never take a decision when you're at a peak. That means madly, madly in love or really, really upset. You should take these decisions because they're important decisions when things are okay. You're right in that, you know, you're right at your mean as, as a couple. So the first thing, anticipate. Second thing, uh, this might sound surprising, but be kind. I mean, keep your head high, uh, be kind, uh, try to let the other person down easy, especially perhaps with, with someone who's vulnerable, like a narcissistic mu- individual might be. Um, we know that, um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of narcissists are in some ways fragile, even if they can hide it. So you want to let them down easy. And when you talk to them, you talk to the vulnerability as much as possible, not to the arrogance, because if you start talking to the arrogance, you're going to trigger something and then you're not, you're not going to be hurt. The third, third rule I would say is, is just like with, I guess with any breakup, when you break up, you break up. That means you put an end to the connection. So sometimes people break up and then they, you know, they're still connected to their partner on social media. No. Uh, and this goes for your teens as well. If you have teens, you know, you break up, we try to, we, 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 we disconnect. 
So we, we don't follow a person on social media and, and so on and so forth. So I, I would say it's the same rules as with any type of relationship, perhaps with the exception that you need to anticipate, especially if there's a potential for harm, right? So how are you going mm-hmm. to get out of the situation? And that's where a counselor, a therapist, uh, uh, or, or very, very good friends might come in handy, right, to help you plan for this. Do you think people who have um, NPD get enough sympathy? Empathy or sympathy? Sympathy. Sympathy. Um, that's a great... Because uh, you know why? I, I, I'm only bringing this... Because you said in the breakup, you know, be kind. You know, remember, this person also can feel vulnerable, the narcissist, right? Mm-hmm. And... I mean, maybe it's just what I've seen, like either on social media or, uh, you know, people who have been in relationships, but, um, they, they're, they don't, there's not a lot of empathy maybe for narcissists, even though narcissists may not have empathy. Right. And, um, but I mean, if it, if, if, if it really is or can be a mental health disorder, why do we, why do we regard it any differently than let's say severe depression or other mental health disorders. No, I, I mean, the rule of thumb for any kind of therapy, and if you want to get anything done, regardless of what your, your outcome, what, what outcome you're, you're trying to accomplish is you need to express empathy. I, I worked in a prison system with, with sex offenders and pedophiles. You have to find a way, and this is going to sound very surprising, but you have to find a way to like them. I don't mean admire them. I don't mean truly like them, but to connect with the suffering. Otherwise, there's no way to do any kind of therapeutic work with them, right? Because you're always in response to what they've experienced. So I think that anyone deserves um, empathy and sympathy, um, including someone who's who's narcissistic. Because, and again, you have to think in terms of a continuum, right? So the more severe the case, the more difficult it's going to be, and the more you want to, you might want to pick up your bags and run. But in lighter forms, you know, someone who has some tendency to be narcissistic, uh, narcissistic traits, for example, well, they deserve just as much uh, empathy as anyone else. There's no doubt. And if you might, so why do you think you might make, why do you think they don't get a lot of sympathy? Well, narcissism and is not dangerous. If anything, it's annoying, right? So once you you pass that money, that the honeymoon period period, when you're with someone and you feel well yourself, confident about you are about who you are and you're with someone who steals the spotlight continuously takes credit for what you do it's extremely annoying it's extremely annoying so it's hard to have empathy for these people there's no doubt it's very hard this is someone who is really like a hardcore narcissist right they they really ha- have a high high level of narcissism mm-hmm. um do do they usually um no matter what the situation and you know they've hurt other people let them down it's all about them um do they re- do they believe that in the end like do that they like there's just so little lack of empathy that they come out of every situation i'm great i i'm i'm great again uh- Think continuum, think severity. So in most severe cases, yes. So uh, mm-hmm. most severe cases that, for example, when I work in the prison system, you're going to have narcissistic personality disorders, individuals who have narcissistic personality disorder. It's never their fault. That's that's a given, right? right? So it's your fault. Um, and, and even if I fail, somehow it's your fault. It's because you didn't, you know, you weren't present or you didn't support and so on and so forth. Or people don't understand or they don't see my value or they don't see how great I am, or they're not smart enough to understand someone as smart as myself, right? So it's it's an externalizing condition in the sense that the blame is outwards, not inwards. Uh, do, do they feel a victim? <clears throat> uh, the, uh, a victim, not necessarily, unless things crash. It's going to be more along the lines of not being understood, not being valued, not being uh, uh, appreciated at, at their full potential and value. That's how they're going to experience it. And again, the blame is, doesn't sit with me. It sits with you because you're just not getting how great I am and how good I am at this job, right? It's you who's not understanding this. Um, so I don't think there's a, it's necessarily in terms of being a victim as it is in terms of you're, you're just not getting it. And odds are yeah. if you're not getting it, it's because you're not as smart and as brilliant as I am because I'm getting it, right? So, so would that be true for you as the therapist? That the, 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 the person in prison would say, 
you, Martin, don't understand me. Absolutely. You don't get it. Absolutely. Mm. And, and when you have these kinds of traits, what you'll notice very often in clinical work is a lot of testing. So they're going to test you. They're going to test you about your knowledge, right? They're going to tell you about how they have experience being in therapy and they'll, they'll, they will correct you for what you're doing in therapy with them. You see this with people who have strong narcissistic trait and strong antisocial traits as well, particularly. So there's, there's this testing and, and, and it makes sense because they have to determine whether or not they can trust you. And part of your job originally, especially in the beginning of the process, and especially if there's antisocial traits, is to contain, right? So if I feel extremely offended, vulnerable, destabilized by the fact that he's questioning my knowledge all the time, he has every good reason in the world not to have faith in me and not to confide in me. So I have to contain that, right? So that's what, there's a, there's this play that often happens at the beginning of, of therapy where you have to contain that. And there's a bit of a tendency for what we call role reversal, right? So sometimes it almost feels like, well, hold on, are, are you in the dock seat right now or am I in the dock seat, right? Like who's doing what right now? Because they like to talk about their knowledge and, and their experience and so on and so forth. And we've had situations in clinical practice, we see that as well with students who have a lot of difficulty um, um, dealing with this, where the patient congratulates, you know, the therapist on what they're doing. Oh, you're doing, that was a good intervention. Great. You know, like last time, last week was disappointing, but you, you're, you're really catching on this time. So when you're a young therapist, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of, uh, that's sort of intimidating, right? There's going to be this testing. There's going to be this testing of the relationship. Um, no doubt, no doubt. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, going back to what you said about working um, with people uh, who have NPD in prisons, and um, I mean, you're talking about perhaps dangerous criminals, right? Who have NPD, like they, they, yeah, yeah. And you said it's really important in therapy that the therapist like the person they're treating. They don't have to admire them. Yeah. But there has to be some kind of like or connection to these people in order to be mm -hmm. successful at, if at all successful at treatment. So how, what do you, like, what strategy or <laughs> what do you do to achieve that? Well, it, it, it's a deliberate effort <laughs> because uh, sometimes you read the file and it's really hard to find a way to like them. And also interpersonally, if there's this malignant uh, aspect to them, it makes it very hard uh, well, they're not particularly likable, although they can be very charming, right? Uh, which is somewhat something slightly different. The trick for me is, is uh, as with any individual that I have sitting across from me in, in therapy, is connecting with the suffering as much as possible. Connecting with the with the with the narrative that the person may be trying to hide or compensate. Um, that's connected to a history of suffering, disappointment, not being valued, and so on and so forth. That's true for narcissists, just, like, just as, as it is with you know individuals who might have other conditions as well. So that's that's really the key, uh, I think, to finding a way to like. It's to understand why someone is doing something, why they're behaving in a given way, and what this seeks to what they're seeking to accomplish through this behavior. And for narcissists, most of the time, it's compensating for this. This, this sense of being deeply inadequate. Mm. Is there a lesson in that for all of us? <laughs> well, that's a great, great question. Um, <clears throat> let me put it to you this way. I think um, what we want is, in all things, is to have a worldview that's nuanced. Uh, that means a view of our, a view or representation of ourselves and the people who are uh, around us who are nuanced. That means not splitting in the sense of seeing things as either good or bad or dichotomous, if you, if you will. You know, I'm so great. I'm so grandiose. And, um, you know, or seeing uh, others or, uh, as all bad either. You know, you poor fools who do not have my intelligence. You know, I, I, I pity you. We don't want that. In many ways, I think the, the key to mental health is nuance. Um, so there's a few people who are all good, uh, all bad. They're extremely, extremely rare. Um, where most of us, we're, we're a bit of both. And, and if we can accept that, I think we'll be proud about the things that we do, the things we achieve. Um, and that would be healthy narcissism. And when we're disappointed uh, by ourselves and, and by others, then we'll, I guess we'll be able to forgive.
Wow. I learned so much from this discussion, Martin. Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so- I hope everyone, and I'm sure everyone else did too. Thank you so much again for, for your time and trouble and joining us and, and uh, going through all, all of this. Uh, it, it's an education for sure. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. That is Martin Drapeau. He's a clinical psychologist and professor of counseling psychology and psychiatry at McGill University. For more information on Martin and his research, please check out our show notes. And also, please check out his previous podcast with us on psychotherapy. That is it for the Cram Podcast today. We hope you enjoyed it, and we would love it if you followed us on social. Our handle is at Cram Ideas, and we'd also appreciate a review as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here next time.